Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. So, uh, this is our fuel cellar, eh? The room looks like a very large warehouse, with pallets upon pallets of dark metal boxes neatly aligned. Kor is a ship engineer in the Eta Carine Defense Force, and he is welcoming his first human technician on board. He is motivated and knows that both species share a sense of humor. Carinidas are laid back and patient. Humans are quite very enthusiastic. Hmm. There is a sense of raw power in that place, sir. It almost feels uh, threatening. Feel the energy! He moved his arms around enthusiastically. I uh, can't wait to know what this mighty ship runs on. Powerful stuff we humans couldn't understand. Right? He extends his arms and gently rubs one of the metal boxes, which feels cool to the touch. Oh, don't you worry about what we're keeping in there. I cannot possibly blow up or any crap like that. Oh, why is that so? Are you keeping your fuel units within ultra-cool dampening fields with vortex scrubbers in case there's a leak? Cor, looking horrified. No, 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 no. These are not like human fuel cells. Not at all. We don't carry those in the FTL ship. That would be madness. No, we don't mind carrying concentrated energy stuff around. Uh, lithium halide, plutonium, thorium, hexane, uh, proton plasma torons, uh, antimatter drops. Uh, that's the crap. We do mind. There is an uncomfortable silence as the human starts tapping his thumb on the dark metal bottle. And the alien looks tense. He knows what the next question will be. What is um, in the bottles? Okay, fair enough. I knew that it would come to this. Listen carefully, Jerry. And please, don't assume that every sentient race out there wants to carry antimatter in their back pockets. The human looks on with a blank face. We can't afford to carry unconcentrated energy sources through FTL jumps. Why? Because we're not suicidal. No offense. None taken. As you might know, we have developed powerful subatomic energy extractors, which basically rip protons from an isotope and turn the isotope into a slightly lower mass element, generating lots of energy in the process. We call it degenerate antifusion. Jerry confused. Antifusion. Why not call it fission? That would be a totally different thing. We're not breaking up atoms. We're merely robbing them of their precious protons. Y you get it? Hey, I'm not a physicist. Just the ship propulsion technician. So, um... This, uh, anti-fusion, uh, what's it about anyway? We can take uh, some atoms and turn them into lighter atoms, generating energy. The optimal one is carbon. Our ship eats carbon, not uranium, not antimatter. We store our carbon into fatty carbon chains. Fatty whatever what? what? Let me look up the triglycerides and come up with an explanation for you. The alien taps on the tablet and scrolls through formulas and molecules... Okay, um, palmitic acid, steric acid, oblic acid. We bind the three molecules together so that they form a stable paste. Then we soak it into a liquid of glucose and churn to improve the carbon output. The alien continues. Our engines injectors heat up the paste and then turn individual carbon atoms into boron using quantum foam torque fields that you wouldn't understand. Boron waste is then used for ship hull construction. The alien hands the tablet to the now very bored human. He shrugs, taps on some of the molecule diagrams, and runs a search in Earth Encyclopedia. Then a gigantic grin illuminates his face. Dude! What? Dude, man, oh man! Your ship runs on white chocolate! Also, uh, I want to taste it. End of story. Story number two. Humans Hallucinate Every Night. Written by JCB112. Livestream online. Help me. I've locked myself in the bathroom and I'm scared. I think there's something very wrong with my human roommate. R right now, he he's tossing and turning in his sleep. Talking, whispering. Sometimes, even crying. Oh, or laughing. No, I've locked myself in the bathroom just in case he decides to get violent. I really, 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 really need help right now. So I'm going to divulge everything wrong with a human up until this point. This is being live-streamed. So, if the stream suddenly cuts, sir, uh, please send help. 
Dorm 27, 502A, Complex 5, Galactic Union, Co-Species University, Union Campus. The second campus of Union. The planet, not the space station. Distant thuds. Feck! Okay, it's getting worse. I, I need to continue now. See, uh, everyone knows humans are the new kids in the block. They're unassumingly bland. Humanoid, two legs, two arms, fuzzy head, sort of fuzzy body, two eyes and a mouth... Barely any canines, blah, 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 blah. You get the point. J -j Just start Galactopedia if you want a biology lesson. Well, but when I signed up, I didn't even know what they were. Now I do. But, like, you get your roommate assignment literally on the day of arrival. So when I saw the assignment roster, I was immediately freaked out and uh, r r rightfully so. Because the university has a tendency to pair you up with the worst possible kinds of species. You know, when you enrolled into the GUCSU, you sort of know what you're signing up for. New experiences, bleeding edge research, broadening your cultural horizons, networking, g g getting fast tracked in, in, into certain careers in a galactic uni because of certain prerequisites and preferential referral system. Anyways, you, you get the drill. The, the risk of signing up. For the GUCSU, however, is the very real possibility that you'd be paired with uh, some less than hospitable species. Uh, you get the Thalactnoxans, who will literally kick you out for the dorm so that they can get their buddies to bunk up with them, leaving you to sort out accommodations yourself. Th th then you get the Velma, the fecking bug people. You haven't really experienced a horror until you bunk with one of them. The absolute horror when you see them in the corner of your eye, or when grabbing a midnight snack and the lights off. <laughs> Pure terror fuel. Th then, then you get the Tulare. Uh, they're just bird people, but trust me when I say this, they're not as cute or as noble as you might think. Anyway, it's, it's cut to the chase. So I get my room assignment, Complex 5. Okay, that, that, that's a mixed bag. It's built for humanoids, so we can discount the fecking Valmar or, or any kind of fecked up cosmic horror being assigned there. 4A, now, now, now here's where the problems start to come in. 5A is technically the fancier version of 5B. Better facilities, swankier furniture, expensification, nice bathrooms, but uh, it's also where they assign the new species, uh, it's to give them a nice warm impression to the galactic community, to make them feel welcome and all that cookie-cutter diplomacy crap. But yeah, I knew that I was in hot water because I was being assigned to the true unknown. A human. So with a quick Galactopedia search, I found out a bit about them, and they seemed uh, alright. I'd been glued to my phone for so long that I didn't even realize that I'd reached the room. Upon entering, uh, my, my, my jaws dropped. There was a banner strung across the little entryway of the room where you left your shoes and whatnot. This couldn't have been in the university thing. They weren't this thoughtful, so uh, I knew this must have been the humans doing. The banner read in galactic standard, Welcome, Rumi! So I knew that I was working with a literate alien, one where there was considerate, but I still kept my guard up. Upon entry into the surprisingly spacious combined living room and kitchen area, a wonderful aroma assaulted me. The human had apparently prepared me something quick enough to make it under an hour. He greeted me with a warm smile, and the human take on the tower nut mix cake. It was at that point that things seemed to be a done deal. We respected each other's space, we set boundaries, we spoke about each other's species quirks, everything. After the day's orientation lectures, I thought things would go down well. <sighs> Spoiler alert. It didn't. The first night clued me into the strangeness that was the human sleep cycle. You see, we at Tull have very deep sleep, to the point where you probably wouldn't even be able to wake us with nothing short of a constant physical stimuli. Irregardless of the fact, no, no species really makes any real uh, noise when sleeping, at least non-intelligible ones. Sure, some may, may, may have snoring problems, obstructive apneic events, or a thing that happens in us air-breathing species after all. But actual, proper, vocalized words, full-on sentences, weird bouts of laughter. Now that's the stuff of terrors. Never gig begs the question, are they truly sleeping, or are they faking it? That night, I had the human talking throughout the night. It was punctuated by periods of quiet, but 
It felt as if it was talking constantly. Okay, I, I might be exaggerating here, but still. I first assumed that it was him being homesick and just video calling his parents or, or, or something, you know. So I didn't think too much of it. The second night was where I knew that this couldn't be a video call because nothing he spoke made sense. There seemed to be no rhyme or reason to what he said. It could start with something like, The exotic butters are here to stay. The more, to the more concerning threats such as, Can El Toe be kicked like a football? The enigma such as, Can aliens dream? Thankfully, sleep took me as it always did. But every time I awoke, I awoke to the nagging anxiety of my own demise. And so it went, day after day, as I attempted to ignore the problem. We had separate rooms, after all, and I could lock my door. Surely everything would be all right, and... Then it happened. Two weeks in and about half an hour before I went to sleep, with my earbuds on to cancel out any noise, I saw my doorknob shaking. It rattled visibly, constantly, and it wasn't just a few seconds of it either. It was a full, uninterrupted minute of the uh, door rattling. I dared not take my earbuds off as I hid underneath the sheets. It eventually went away, but at that point I needed to confront the human about it. And so it went, the human describing to me the issues of rampant sleep talking and the rare occasional sleepwalk. He seemed embarrassed, but increasingly confused as I told him I could not understand what he meant by the fact that the nature of these actions would tie into yet another concept called dreaming. When he explained it to me, I, uh, I thought he was joking. He told me that every human had uh, v v visions during their sleep, some more vivid than others, and sometimes not at all, but more often than not, these visions took the form of full-on, as he described them, movies that are forced to watch or live through with little to no agency. That terrified me. So humans were effectively forced to live entirely different lives for eight hours without any say or any control of their hallucinatory states. The fact that nightmares existed simply added fuel to the fire, imagining going the rest of a tired day of being awake, only to sleep and find out that you are now deep into eight-hour-long horror movie with no control. The revelation that made me terrified of the human more so was than any Thalaxian brute or any Valmar bug. Because this means that this human, no, all humans go through literal hell on earth every single day. No other species did this. I tried to come to terms with this. I really did, but the fear still lingered at the back of my mind. Especially... After I found a documentary on a human murdering someone in cold blood in their sleepwalks. What if one day that was me? The human, Patrick. He was an honest and earnest man. Smart, shy, but very kind. But at night, he, uh, he wasn't himself. At night, he would be Voltax, the despoiler. And I would be none the wiser. And that brings me to... My current situation. As I sit here, bed sheets and blankets inside of a bathtub with Patrick stomping all around the dorm, having somehow found his way into my room. What do I do? End of story. I just quickly want to thank the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka.